the reading of God's Word. Stand with me. Real short and real simple today. It is one verse. Hear now the reading of God's Word. Truly, truly I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. This is the reading of God's word. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Let us hear it. Let us believe it and transform our hearts and minds today. We pray in Jesus. Amen. Be seated. On the topic of God's word, we have been uh, offered the opportunity to use a, an application as a church, Veritas Bible. If you, it, it's, a, it's a series of games for young people that teaches them the, the truth of God's word. Uh, if you are interested in that, see me. We have some codes. It's a paid program. And um, we have a former member of this church that moved off and, and now works for them that said, hey, I'm looking for a few churches to trial this. And they have offered us a free trial, a free usage of it for um, s several families that want to use this, this uh, application. So if you're interested, talk to me. Um, we'd love your feedback on how it works and how it's working for you. Um, the program has been around for several years. They're looking to see if they can use and build it through churches. So um, we may have some other ideas of how we might use this, but it's a great, great uh, opportunity for us to get some free access to uh, gamification of the Bible and, and implanting that in the hearts of our young people. And I bring that up at this time of the worship because the Word of God is the most significant thing in our lives. Um, where we learn about justification by faith alone, through Christ alone, in the Word of God. That's what we're going to see as from Martin Luther today of how he landed where he did in the Gospels. And so uh, if you're interested in that, talk to me. I would love to share that uh, with you. Um, one last thing, it's, it's a note about worship that I wanted to highlight. We've changed how we're doing communion slightly. We're not singing at the first part. I meant to mention this earlier and I forgot. Um, I want us to use med the, the communion time, the first part of it, when we're distributing the elements as a time of meditation. But I want to instruct your meditation. Uh, it was told me long ago that this is not a time when you feel very contrite and confessing of my sins. When we're receiving the blood and the body of the body and blood of Christ, we've already walked through the worship service of confession of sin, hearing the pardon of Christ. We are now at a celebratory time. So as you hold those elements or you wait to receive them and the music's playing, reflect and pray to God about what this is. This is life, the body and blood of Christ. So as you hold those elements, uh, that's what I want us to reflect on today to pray about, to think about. Give us just a few minutes for our hearts to settle in on what it is that we have really received from Jesus Christ. The Gospels, ancient yet relevant for our lives today. That's our sermon series that we, were in, we are in. This will take us through the uh, Advent season, Christmas season, whatever wording you prefer to put on it, um, depending on what angle we're coming from. Uh, this will carry us through the end of the year. And what we are looking at is walking through various aspects of the four Gospels that are in the New Testament and looking at how the truth that they teach and how it applies and why it's relevant to us today. Because there are many out there who would say the Word of God was very impactful to society many years ago, but the church used it in very bad ways to create wars and to manipulate people. Uh, during the Dark Ages, the medieval church would hide and, and mask what it actually said because the people couldn't read it. It wasn't in their language, and so they used it to control the people. And what we want us to understand is that, no, the Bible is very relevant to today. It's ancient. It doesn't mean it's old. It means it's lasting. Its truths are real and powerful for our lives today. 
Today we're looking at John 5, verse 24. The topic that we are focusing in on is justification. Reformation Sunday, right? We are looking at what it is that Martin Luther saw in the, the scriptures that transformed the church. Now, Martin Luther's credited with a lot. 504 years ago today, October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther, as most of you know, took he wrote down 95 theses, 95 propositional statements of things that he thought needed to be debated in the church. Theological truths that the church was elevating, that he was studying going, man, I just don't think we've got this right. Here are, here are things that I think we need to talk further about. Now, Martin Luther, it shouldn't be credited as the only person who had these thoughts. A hundred years prior, oh, yeah, a uh, hundred years prior, there were men and people who were leading and, and doing translations of the Bible. You've got Wycliffe and other people who were, who were translating the Bible into to English, and they were, they were uh, John Huss, and these people were going questioning the things of the Roman Catholic Church. But in Martin Luther's day, the Lord brought it to a head. A movement began at that time that would burn the chaff of church tradition off of the gospel. So they, they had this core of the gospel, and they had wrapped it with so many things and teachings of the church that were not found in Scripture that the gospel was no longer visible. It was a nugget hidden away, and it was of no value to the people. Church tradition had hidden the gospel from the common person and even from the leadership. The Reformation, what is called the Great Reformation, that is said to have sparked in 1517 on that day when he nailed those 95 theses to the door of the church. It focused the light on the gospel truth over church tradition. It peeled back the onion. It said, do we need to really, is this true? No. Peel another layer of the onion. Is this true? No. Peel another layer of the onion. Is this true? No. And in the end, Martin Luther, the reformers, and the church had found the gospel again. We should be very thankful. We should be grateful Today, we're going to look at a core aspect of that reforming message. Justification by faith alone. It is unearned. It is not something that you must go do and act a certain way in order to be justified before God. Now, this term in Scripture is a legal term, and it, you've heard, you hear me talk about this all the time. Uh, there's a quote that's credited to Luther online, but you know I, sometimes you wonder about some of these things. But he says, "I preach the I preach justification to my congregation every week because they forget it every week, or they forget it all the time, or it goes something like that." <clears throat> and so, what is justification? It you've heard the little saying, "Just as if I'd never sinned." But let me give you a different description, a little bit a little bit more detail. You're standing in a courtroom, guilty as everything. I, he caught me speeding. Yes, maybe I killed the person. I've got blood on my hands. I was guilty as everything. I, I, I plead guilty, Your Honor. Now it's time to do the punishment. And somebody stands up beside you and says, Sir, I've already taken his punishment. Oh, and by the way, you might see perfection. He, he actually didn't kill anybody. I'm, 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 I'm giving him my righteousness. That person's Jesus. And the judge looks at you, guilty, blood-stained, speeding ticket, whatever you're guilty of, and he goes, you're free to go. Sin no more. Justification is a declaration of innocence based upon someone else's taking your sentence, your punishment. And, and even more so, 
He also gave you the righteousness necessary to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because God doesn't say you just have to be guiltless. You must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, is what scriptures say. It's a double whammy. I thought we were just trying to avoid sin. I didn't know I was really truly had to do those good works you keep talking about. God says, yeah, you have to have both of them. But here's the beauty of justification as it's taught in Scripture. Jesus did all the work. From beginning to end, he completed it. That's what we have before us today. Now, one of those quotes from Luther, he says, so you're saying, do we work nothing for the obtaining of this righteousness? And Luther answers, nothing at all. For those of us that grew up in the church, you're like, but I know they've been telling me I'm supposed to be a good boy. I know I'm there like lots, I mean, lots of things I shouldn't be doing because I get told every day I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't be doing this, I should stay away from this. Justification, your ticket and entry into eternal life, your, your ability to stand before a holy God is based upon the merits of Christ alone. Luther came to understand that God's grace was not to be earned by meritorious works, but that Christ had finished the work of salvation, which was available by faith. That's written by Nathan Feldmeth in a pocket dictionary of church history. I was just reading through, I thought he worded that really well. So I thought it worth reading off to you. Now, how is it then that this message spread? And, and why was it so novel? Because I think most of us go, yeah, yeah, I've heard that. I try to believe it, but I really get down on myself, and sometimes I feel like I'm not saved. But how is it that this message spread? Well, you, you've heard. If you, if you ever go to Disney World and you go up the little ball, the, the spaceship Earth, it, it tells the story of now the printing press was created. And you're like, oh, Martin Luther. They don't talk about Martin Luther, but if you've been through seminary, your mind jumps to him. They say the, the words that Martin Luther wrote spread because of the printing press. So what had happened in years past is all these ideas were coming out, but they would stay in their little pocket places because you, had to, you couldn't, couldn't propagate them. But then one day somebody went, snatched the note off the door, went to the printing press, made copies, and propagated it everywhere. So Martin's 95 Theses and all the things he began writing got spread. But that wasn't the only thing that was happening. Martin Luther had another idea. I'm going to translate the Bible to German. I'm going to put it so that they can read it. And here's where the Reformation really sparks. Let me show you what is true. 95 theses of things we need to discuss. Now let me give you the source book so that you can read it. And Everybody goes, well, I'll be. That is what it says. The Spirit of God was awakened during that time. Not that he was asleep, but he came. He, he awakened the hearts of men and women and children across the land by giving them the scriptures that they can read. The common people can now read for themselves rather than sitting to hearing a priest drone on in a language they could not understand, telling them things that were not true about scripture. And it was confirmed by Scripture when they read it. And then the gospels, the gospel was spread by the church and confirmed by the Spirit through the Word. The church being the leaders and all the people saying, it wasn't Martin Luther that ran around everywhere. It was the people that listened to him. The church took him and said, look what my pastor's teaching. This is amazing. Well, how do you know it's true? Read this. That's how the Reformation transformed everything. That's how we became Protestants. Protestants. We are protesting against the established church. So back in that day, the church had a problem. We're, 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 we are celebrating Reformation Sunday or focusing in on it because the church had a problem. The medieval church had come up with a system 
They said that your sin required absolution. You go, well, yeah, our sin requires pardon. There's a difference, though. You had to go before a priest to confess. You've seen the movies. They have the little box and whatever it looked like back then. But they had to go to a man, a priest, to confess their sin. And then that priest would pronounce them and, and, and actually absolve them of their sin. So they had to have a priest hear their sin and absolve them of it. You go, well, isn't that what you just did, Rick, when you gave me the assurance of pardon? No, 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 no. Rick absolves no one of their sins. All I can do is proclaim to you the gospel hope. I can assure you that if you believe upon the, the Jesus Christ and you, you confess your sins in faith in Jesus Christ, then you are forgiven. That is not me forgiving you. That is me proclaiming the truth of God's word. But the Roman Catholic Church had created a system over the years where the priest had to absolve you. And not only that, once that occurred, you had to go give penance, which was voluntary self-punishment, maybe, inflicted as an outward expression of repentance for having done wrong. You want the dictionary definition? Had to go do some good things. Had to go make up for my sin. You ever feel that way? I really should do something good today because I did some really bad stuff yesterday. I need the, the next year should be a good year because the last five have been really bad. I need to make up for my transgressions against the Lord. The debt of forgiven sin would grow. They never made up for it. And it could be reduced through performance of good works in this life. They might take pilgrimages. That's actually what Martin Luther was doing. He was on a pilgrimage to, uh, I think it was Rome, and, and he's climbing these steps, and each step you did a Hail Mary, and at some point he realized, what am I doing? There are all these people climbing these steps trying to earn righteousness, and you're going, I've been reading the Bible, and is this climbing steps? And Is this really what God wants us to do to find forgiveness before a holy God? I mean, if it is, yes, I will do this, but I don't think I've ever seen this in Scripture. And Martin's struggling with this, and he, he, I, I, I'll do charitable acts. I'll go visit holy places, things that have been used in, in, in the past to, 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 in great ways. Um, but I don't, I don't see this in Scripture as a requirement for me being declared not guilty before God. You see, in the Roman Catholic Church, what they had during the medieval ages was this idea that the sacraments of the church, there were seven, and they were utilized by the church to make you not guilty. They were, they, those sacraments were actually cleansing you. And we go, no, there's only two sacraments set up in Scripture. And what they do is they point you to the faith and to the truth of the gospel that forgives you. This doesn't cleanse you. It's not the grape juice cleanses your insides and all of a sudden you're forgiven. It is a picture and, a, and, a, and an image and a seal of the salvation that is yours by faith. But they had this system set up where you had to be involved in a church walking through these sacraments to be forgiven because you had to make up for your sins. You had to do good things. You had to do penance. And um, Luther came along and he said, I, just, I don't see that in Scripture. That's a problem. So justification to them, being right with God, was you have a little Christ, and then you have a little penance to go make up for your sins. And then that led to the incorruption of indulgences. They came up with purgatory. They, they came up with all these... Because they go, okay, what happened? I don't know the exact how... I wasn't involved in the meetings of how they, all these things came about, but throughout time, they go, what about these people that die and haven't haven't really made up for all their sins. Oh, well, that's purgatory. That's a, that's a holding place so they can, they can work off all the sins that they didn't work off in this life. Well, what if they can't get out of there really? If, oh, well, we can, we can, you can pay money to help other people that have gone before you get out, and the Pope will forgive the sins of those in purgatory. I mean, they created this elaborate system and created a big husk around the this, this, this seed of the gospel and it was all lies. None of that's in Scripture. And Martin Luther goes, what have we done? And it's all a money-making scheme. And this guy comes through 
selling indulgences in his city. And Martin Luther is appalled at this. And they're raising money for a new, uh, a new uh, church building. And, and, and it's just, he's, he's floored. The church had lost the doctrine and truth of justification. It's like you dropped your keys off the boat into the muddy lake. And you just kind of go, never going to find those again. They're gone. Luther said, um, if the article of justification be once lost, then is all true Christian doctrine lost? So for those of you that are sitting here today going, why are we talking about justification again? Because Martin Luther thinks it's important, but that's not the only reason. Rick thinks it's important, but Scripture thinks it's important. Church history testifies to us of its criticality. Because throughout history, justification and sanctification, when they begin to blend, error and heresy are the fruit. Because you then begin recognizing your own works as a means to earn favor with God. And that's not what happens, because how did Noah do it? He found it. Noah found favor. God decided to be gracious to Noah. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious to. God has said that we cannot earn our salvation. It is not possible. We must quit trying. So the church had a problem. The Holy Spirit came in with a solution. So that Roman Catholic theology, um, Sproul is the one that kind of highlighted for me that people were made righteous through the sacraments of the church. And then he said, uh, Luther came to um, the verses in the New Testament, and one of them, Romans 1.17, the, the last part of it says, the ra- righteous shall live by faith. He's actually quoting, Paul's quoting Habakkuk here. It's quoted in three places in the New Testament. And, and Martin Luther begins to see this idea of righteousness by faith. He says, so I need righteousness. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to be good to the way that God wants me to be good. I want to be a good person. And he says, but that's by faith? He starts working through this, and he realizes that this Romans 1.17 is like the central argument of the book of Romans, that your righteousness comes by faith. And, and this truth, uh, Sproul says, opened the doors of paradise to Martin Luther. It awakened his mind to something that he had closed off from because Christianity, had be, he started his trek into um, to become a monk because he was in a, a rainstorm, thunderstorm, and he was going to be uh, study law, and lightning was striking all around him. He panics, and he says, Lord, if you'll just save me, I'll become a monk or uh, and, and so over time, he ends up as a priest, uh, and, and, he, and, he, and he lands in this role in the church, I should say, and, 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 become, and he gets ultimately kicked out of the Roman Catholic Church. But God put him there because this was the Holy Spirit's solution, is to use him to awaken the world to the fact that justification, righteousness is given to us as a gift by the Holy Spirit from God Almighty by faith. If you go back up in Romans 1.17, it says, For in it, in the gospel, read further into that verse, in the gospel, uh, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. What this is trying to tell us, what this, what Paul is arguing here, is that In the gospel message, if you peel back the onion layers of the church tradition and history and you get to the core of the gospel, it's that the perfection required by God is revealed to us. The gospel, it reveals to us that the the, the righteousness required by God comes from faith. It originates out of faith. And Martin Luther goes, now how is that possible? So the righteousness of God is not God's righteousness, but the righteousness required of me from God, which is perfection. It comes from, it grows out of faith and to faith, ends in faith. And so it's all in faith. It comes to me only by faith, surrounded by faith, and is a package and a gift of faith. And you've heard it this way. 
if someone gives you a free gift, what do you have to do to accept that gift? Reach out and take it. You have to believe that there's something in it. Now, if somebody gives you, if a child gives you a gift, one of my children, you might think it's a box of something you don't want sometimes. And you go, I'm not taking that. I don't believe this is a gift I would like. God gives you a gift. The only sensible thing to do is reach and take it. But the fallen mind, the broken heart, the one that will not that is not regenerate will say, I, I don't want that. But by faith, we reach and take that free gift and we find the righteousness required of us. It is justification by faith alone. Luther realized the power to forgive rested in Christ alone, not the Pope. The layers that they had placed around of church history, the indulgences that they were selling. You can spring a life from purgatory when the coin in the coffer rings a soul from purgatory springs. You've heard this. And he says the Pope was taking money and then going, Jimmy's out, Timmy's out, Sarah's out. The Pope can't forgive sins. He's a mere man. He's not the head of the church. And Martin didn't go as far as we would go today in a lot of things originally. He wasn't looking to destroy the church. He was looking to reform the church until they excommunicated him. But Martin Luther realized along with John Calvin and many others that followed him, that the only head of the church is Jesus Christ. The only one who can forgive sin is Jesus Christ. The only way that sin can be forgiven is through the blood of Jesus Christ offered on our behalf. And here's the kicker. Every Christian doctrine must harmonize with justification that is freely given to all who believe in the Son. Salvation is a free gift of God. We can't then come to the sections of Scripture that say, be holy as your Father in heaven is holy, and go, I know justification is a free gift, but the Scriptures say be holy, so you better be holy or you're going to hell. It doesn't work that way. Once you receive the free gift, the result and response is sanctification. We'll talk about sanctification next week. But we must understand every doctrine of theology of the, of the Word of God. It must harmonize with justification by faith alone or we are in error. Now, the church had a problem. The Holy Spirit came with a solution. What was the result? The result was the Great Reformation. The birth of the Protestant church. The reason that we exist in the form that we do today and the true gospel being reclaimed and proclaimed across the world, freed from the shackles of death, freed from the ones who would try to use it to manipulate people and control them, freed by God Almighty who says, my church will forever stand until my son comes to bring them home. Now you may say, that's great, Rick, but you said we were talking about the Gospels today, and I haven't seen John 5, 24 come up one time. Found it. What I wanted us to grasp today, the truths of the Reformation, these things aren't a bunch of people reasoning and going, I think we've got it wrong. Now let me go find it in Scripture. What happened with Martin Luther is he kept reading Scripture, and he was responsible for teaching it. And he kept going, man, it's all over the place. Matt read a verse earlier, so this is Luther's go-to verse. Righteous shall live by faith is in Galatia. I mean, it's all over the place. It's in the Gospels. The Gospels are an ancient story far surpassing before, before the life of Martin Luther. The words of Jesus, truly, truly, I say to you, if you've heard my word, and then that caused you and turned into belief in me. You got eternal life. It's that simple. It's that simple. You don't come into judgment. But instead of judgment, you pass from death to life. Now you go, 
man, you got to be good. You can't just preach so you pass from death to life. When you're alive, you're alive to Christ. You recognize God as your Father. And no longer do you say, I don't want to do your will. I don't want to follow you and obey you. You start to get that feeling of, I really want to be a good person. I want to honor God. Man, I stink at it. I'm actually kind of terrible. I wish I could do better. I wish I could stop this. I need some help. Those feelings do not mean you're not a Christian. They mean you probably have passed from death to life that you're so concerned about what God thinks about your life. It's evidence of your justification if you truly believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and have heard his word. It's a completed sense. There's nothing left for us to do. And the kicker is that Christ did all the work for us. You feel unworthy? You feel like you're not good enough? I'm not going to pamper you. You're not good enough. You are unworthy. So am I. I may be standing a little taller than you, but it's just because I got further to fall. I am in the same boat as you. But you know who is worthy and who is good enough? Jesus Christ. And that's all that matters. The judgment has been lifted off of us. Death has been defeated. Hell has been escaped. Satan has been rendered powerless. All by Christ's victory. And this victory has been given to us, his people. Only believe. It's a wondrous mystery indeed. Let's pray. Father, thank you for reforming your church restoring to us the true hope of the gospel. Let us each embrace it. And for those in this room today, God, that have not given their life to Christ, who have not confessed their sin before him, who have stayed in the, the boat that Adam and Eve fell into when they, when they rejected you and said, I will not obey you. And, but Lord, if, if there are any in this room today that are in that state, we pray for their souls. We pray that you would regenerate their hearts Turn their hearts towards Christ and, and give them, open their eyes, Lord, that they may see your kingdom, that they may see wonderful things in your law, that they may desire this goodness and this holiness that is defined in your word. And then let them find it in Christ. Save the souls of everyone in this room, we pray today, Jesus. It's in your son's name we pray, Father. Amen.